Well, hello and welcome back to another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and I'm your host today on the show. And if this is your first time to tuning in to the podcast uh, or on one of our YouTube channels, I want to give you a special welcome. We talk about all things real estate investing here on the show. We talk about single family houses. We talk about land. We talk about development. We talk about commercial. We talk about getting funding for your deals uh, without relying on the banks and the mortgage companies. In fact, that's why I'm known as the private money authority. I've been doing the business now in Eastern North Carolina for about 15 years. And I got cut off from the banks about 10 years ago, along with everybody else, had a perfect credit score, never laid on payments. But I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money and have not missed out on a deal since. So we're glad you're here to the show. We just celebrated a couple of months ago, our one year anniversary. We're getting real close to a couple of hundred thousand downloads and listens. So a big thank you to our followers and listeners for tuning in. And speaking of followers and listeners, if you have not subscribed, uh, be sure and subscribe. If you're on iTunes, subscribe, rate and review. Love to get your feedback so you don't miss out on any of the content that we have coming up. We got all the shows archived that you can go back and listen. And if you're on uh, Google Play, you can also tune in as well. And you may be watching on some of the YouTube channels. Over the past year, I've had just amazing, amazing, incredible guests and experts. And today is no different. Uh, but before I introduce my very special guest, I want to give everybody a free gift. I have got an online masterclass waiting for you to attend. It's free and it will take you through the five steps of getting unlimited funding for your deals by using private money. And so here's the special website for you. It's www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. Be sure and check that out after the show. Well, today I'm so excited to have my special guest and friend and colleague on the show with me. He graduated from uh, Ohio School of Broadcasting. You'll be hearing his broadcast voice here in just a moment. He got his degree in broadcast sales and marketing. He also studied marketing at Georgia Tech and also business management at Emory University. Now, what my guest is most known for is he took a talk radio station in Atlanta to the level of, quote unquote, the most listened to station in the world. And yes, he got that designation all the way back in 2002 from Radio and Records magazine. Well, he's got a wide variety of experience. And I told him before the show, he's been way too successful to be at the young age that he is right now. But anyway, he's owned his own advertising agency. He's represented the big clients such as Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, Buffalo Wild Wings, Mail America. And today he is chief executive officer of Think Realty and the American Association of Private Lender. He speaks all around the country. He's in high demand. He speaks at well-known universities on topics of real estate development, branding, marketing, and innovation in business. So my good friend, Eddie Wilson, welcome to the show, Eddie. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be with you today. Man, I tell you what, you know, I could just listen to your voice all day. I mean, much less what you got in between your ears up there. But I can't wait to share you or get into the interview here and and share the information because you got such a varied, you know, background uh, and experience. I mean, you were telling me before the show you were sitting on a couple of different boards. Share that with the audience, what you were recently involved in. Sure. Yeah, I've traveled quite a bit for legislative uh, purposes. I've sat on a subcommittee for finance and various other things, speak a lot with the Federal Reserve and, and their different branches, um, just trying to help them understand who real estate investors and who private lenders are. And so I've been you know, privileged to have that platform. Uh, it's a group of people that our legislators often don't know anything about. Uh, their perception is typically off as to what we provide as a service to our nation. We solve affordable housing issues. We provide uh, opportunities for correcting blight in our neighborhoods. I mean, there's so many good things that real estate investors do. And so I try to make sure that the platform that I've been given and been blessed to have to make sure that they understand who real estate investors are. Perfect. So to our audience, time permitting, we're going to talk about Think Realty, uh, yes, which, which is a publication that you're a CEO of. And um, 
Everybody stay on to the end of the show. And Eddie's going to give out a way that you can get a free subscription to Think Realty. Definitely want to talk about the American Association of Private Lenders, one of my big hot topics. And if time permits, uh, we'll talk about Dodd-Frank because you've been in, uh, involved a lot with the Dodd-Frank law and the effect that that's had or does have on real estate investing today. And you're also really on top of what's going on with the economy and interest rates and et cetera. So we'll see how that goes. Let's start out with, with Think Realty. Eddie, uh, what was the brainchild behind Think Realty, the publication, and, and why have you got it out there and what is it? Sure. So I am the CEO, but also a majority owner of Think Realty and founder. Think Realty was uh, kind of my effort to try to aggregate the real estate investment industry. I had invested in an insurance company and a few other things that really tied well into the real estate investment space, but no one aggregated the in industry. You know, people across the nation would say there's seven or eight or nine million people actively, intentionally investing in real estate. But, you know, depending on what platform you went to, they may have had 250,000 at most or 300,000 people. But it was really difficult to find who these real estate investors are because oftentimes they wouldn't identify themselves as investors. They would identify themselves as a doctor who had rental properties or an engineer who bought rental properties or a roofer that found a good deal and bought a rental property or a fix and flip. And so it was really difficult to find out who these people are. And I believe, you know, content should always lead. And so what I decided to do about three and a half years ago was create the brand Think Realty. Think Realty is an information and in, you know, an education source for real estate investors. There's no educational program that we sell or anything like that, but we, we push great information and education and network through the media platform we have. So first and foremost, it's a website and you can go on there and sign up and it's got all kinds of benefits and things like that to being a member. It's got the publication that we're the only uh, newsstand publication that is for real estate investors. So we're on the shelves of every Barnes and Noble across the country and airports, so on and so forth. And then we have our shows that travel. So we'll have four or five big shows and then a lot of partner events throughout the year, really trying to get real estate investors at a local level to engage with those people around them. Uh, because, you know, we are the national source and we've got a million people a month coming to the platform in one, of, in one way or another. But really, we believe that, that real estate is hyper local. So we really try to push them down to the local level to connect to their local RIA groups, their local networking communities, to make sure that they're finding people to do deals with or to find you know, networks for money. Yeah. And I got to tell my audience that they can go to Think, to think Realty. It's thinkrealty.com, right? Yes, sir. Go to thinkrealty.com and I mean, there's this plethora of back issues of your magazine that is there. And uh, I think you've got a couple of different publications. One is for real estate investing and, and one is, is another audience, correct? Yes, sir. We've got two publications. We have the Think Realty uh, publication, which is primarily more the retail investor. Um, you know, someone who maybe is a little bit newer, they're looking for design tricks or tips, or they're looking for acquisition tricks or tips. But then we also have the housing. Report. So uh, we acquired the housing news report from Adam Data and Realty Track, and now we put out the, the Think Realty Housing News Report. That's a highly data driven uh, magazine that really is for the upper echelon of real estate investors, people that are looking at uh, market data and statistics to make high level decisions in this space. Yeah. So uh, I tell you what, let's don't make the audience wait until the end of the show. How can they go ahead and subscribe and get a free uh, subscription to Think Realty? Yes, sir. They can go right to thinkrealty.com and they can type in forward slash subscribe or just go Think Realty and then click on, on the join button. There is a free membership right now. We have decided this year to give as many free memberships away as possible. Uh, if they want to get the magazine to their doorstep, I think it's $29 a year or something like that. But they can sign up for free, get all the digital information for free, get access to the housing news report, get access to all the uh, discounts that we've uh, lined up for them on Sherwin-Williams and Home Depot and all those kind of things. But uh, they can get all that by just going to thinkreality.com and uh, clicking join or thinkreality forward slash subscribe. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so what I, was, I wanted to tell everyone is that 
I have looked back at your back issues. I've also, you know, received the magazine myself and the contributors that you've got are just amazing contributors. There's, I mean, you talk about lead with content, your magazine leads with content and very, very valuable information. And I'm also excited. I spoke with uh, one of your team members at Think Realty, uh, Rodney, about a month or two ago. And I think you all are getting me lined up to be a regular contributor as well to the magazine. So I'm looking yeah. forward to That's what they tell me. And I'm always looking forward to, you know, to, to having good people in the magazine. Our magazine, yes, we do pay for higher level economists and things like that to write. But primarily, it is people in our industry that have set the bar high that we turn around and say, okay, are you willing to give back, which I know you are. So our magazine is oftentimes comprised of the highest level of investor in any modality or type of investing uh, that we feature through the magazine. Yeah, well, it is phenomenal. And so to all of our audience, that's a no brainer. If you're remotely interested in real estate investing, and I know you are, you wouldn't be here on the show. You definitely want to take up uh, Eddie's free offer there, particularly while the uh, while you can get the digital for free. Well, let's move over to your uh, another one of your enterprises, the American Association of Private Lenders. One of my favorite topics. So, first of all, tell everybody what in the world is the Association of Private Lenders. Yes, sir. The Association of Private Lenders again is just an aggregate of private lenders around the country. It's comprised of people that are you know, private lenders. We've got hard money lenders in there. There's a lot of people in there that do heavy self-directed IRA lending that are a part of that association. And uh, we're pushing close to 600 members around the country. But really, you know, our, our goal for the American Association of Private Lenders, AAPL, is to give them a voice. You know, a few years back when the Dodd-Frank legislation was written, it created a vacuum in our investor community. And it was so important for these private dollars to find their way into the marketplace so that our housing communities could continue to thrive and investors could find the capital to do deals. And so we put this together specifically to bring these people together so that people that are doing deals at a high level can find the capital to support them. And so we do a lot of networking. We do a, ma a huge event in November. It's our 10th anniversary coming up. You'll like this. I invited somebody that is opposite of what everybody thinks I should do, but I did it intentionally. I invited Barney Frank to come have a conversation with private lenders at our 10th anniversary in November in Las Vegas, our big event. And I am getting all kinds of flack for it, but I love it because, you know, the, the guy that wrote the, you know, the most important piece of legislation in lending history is going to come and talk to you. Now, he may be the enemy to a lot of the private lenders, uh, but the reality of it is, is, you know, they need to voice their opinion and they rarely have the opportunity to voice their opinion. And so he's agreed to an open conversation with a lot of our lenders. So that's, that's really what it is about. And then we fight a lot of um, anti, we are the kind of the anti legislative source in lending because we're such a small community that Oftentimes, the mortgage association, associations crowd us out when it comes to state and federal legislation. So we've got a whole government relations committee. We go and do days on the Hill twice a year. We fought major legislation this year in the state of Florida when it came to they were trying to regulate and, and anybody who was lending at any degree, they were trying to get you licensed or force you into some sort of a licensure. So we effectively stopped that, got that tossed out. And so we're just a very active community of private lenders. So who would who would benefit and who who should seriously consider coming to your upcoming big event? Yes, sir. So if you are a private lender, if you are lending to any degree, small or large, if you're, you know, even if it's just you're, you're lending out of your self-directed IRA, you know, it is a great place to come and network and see how people are structuring their deals. As you know, you know, deal structure is one of the most important pieces in private lending. And so you get a lot of great information on people that are structuring their deals different ways. The other thing, too, is, is a lot of people don't understand how to leverage secondary market capital to essentially make their primary capital more valuable. So we've got a lot of guys that come in that have set up their own funds they raise capital on their funds, or maybe their funds are the primary source of that fund, they'll they'll take down deals and then they'll leverage two or three percent money on the secondary market to 
to really create a massive opportunity for them. So, you know, they're, they're a you know, million dollars or $2 million that they typically lend can be worth 30 or 40 or 50 million if they leverage it correctly with some of these bigger secondary money providers. And so that's a huge, if they're lending to come and hear how they can exponentially increase their lending capability. And then thirdly, if you're an investor looking for private capital, I rarely see those guys come into our conference. But if I was looking for capital today, there's more capital in this conference than you've ever seen in your life. I mean, it is amazing. You know, billions and billions of dollars worth of ready capital to be to deploy. And, and I rarely see any heavy investors coming in to go, hey, how do I find uh, access to that capital? So I actually didn't start this organization. I heard about it and I had a big development going on in Chicago and decided, hey, if there's private money there, I'm going to go up there. And I came with a couple of sheets of, you know, of uh, kind of some performance on the, the deal I was doing in Chicago. And I funded my whole deal there. In the end, uh, you know, now I'm part owner and CEO. But you know, if I was an investor, I would seriously consider coming to this conference as well. That's awesome. So, how can people register, and what's the website, and and sure. to get all get all the details? It is aaplonline.com. So, the American Association of Private Lenders, aaplonline.com. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, sounds like a phenomenal event. Now. Um, you were just talking about Dodd Frank, which leads me into one question I wanted to ask you and get your detailed answer. So, real estate investors, if they've been around the block any length of time, they've heard the woes of Dodd Frank, mm -hmm. but very few people, even the quote unquote gurus, very few people have I heard actually speak definitively and really know what they're talking about sure. to this question. And that is today, really, to what degree specifically does Dodd-Frank affect what real estate investors do, what they can do, what they can't do, what they need to be concerned about, what they need to be aware of as relates to Dodd-Frank? I know that's a wide open question, sure. but it's a really, really important question because in my opinion, Eddie, there's a lot of information floating around out there in the education space for real estate investors that people just don't know what they're talking about. So let me turn the mic back over to you and free will on that. Okay. So Dodd-Frank, I think you're absolutely correct, kind of gets this bucket that everybody dumps all their problems in. It's like, oh, the Dodd-Frank legislation caused all these problems. You know, Interesting enough, Dodd-Frank was a knee-jerk reaction to the, the crash in 2007-2008. They wrote legislation that then mandated how much, you know, number one, how much banks could lend and what liability they could take on, and then the parameters by which data and information they would select and qualify. That's basically it, right? I mean, it has seven points to the Dodd, I mean, there's seven major points in the Dodd-Frank uh, bill. And what it did was it made it a little bit difficult, a little bit more difficult to get conventional money. What it did, though, was provide one of the greatest waves of private capital coming into the marketplace than we've ever seen in America. I mean, like the, the, the massive amount of, you know, 13 to 17 billion dollars then coming in from private means, sources of capital coming out of China. I mean, it was amazing the, the vacuum it created. But quickly, by 2009, 2010, that vacuum had already been plugged by private capital that was trying to find a way to find greater returns. So, you know, I think oftentimes the SAFE Act, which was the act that was then, you know, enacted, you know, past that, gets overlooked and Dodd-Frank kind of gets blamed for everything. The SAFE Act probably has more influence on real estate investors based on the regulation that came out of that and all the things that they could or could not do. So what happened this past year? So we went in and, and there was a modification. President Trump uh, did not want to do away with the bill. What he did was cause a modification. So the modification came last May. It was voted on and accepted. And what it did was it allowed small private banks and credit unions the ability to get back into the small business lending game. I would say that investors actually weren't harmed for a long period of time because of Dodd-Frank. That might be a very unpopular opinion, but it's a qualified opinion. 
what happened was the small business community took the greatest brunt of the Dodd-Frank reform because credit unions and small banks were no longer allowed to lend based on the criteria that Dodd-Frank set up. So in that modification, we voted and put in, so like point number three in Dodd-Frank talked about what liability can a small bank take on? Well, that was radically changed. And you're starting to see now small banks small funds and credit unions get back into real estate investing. They first jumped into small business uh, lending last June through, you know, through the summer. And now this year, you're seeing a lot more uh, conventional capital coming from private banks in the real estate investing space. So, you know, to, to say that Dodd-Frank had this massive catastrophic, you know, effect on the, the real estate investing space, I think is a little bit of a farce. What it did was is it changed the mechanism by which the more sophisticated investor made money. For instance, I was building a lot of new construction back in those days and did fine through the, through the, the recession and the downturn. Um, I had capital to work with. I'd sold a business. I was buying things cheap. I was developing in areas that communities were struggling. But then once the banks started taking away the ability for a lot of the investors to borrow, primarily through home equity lines of credit and all the things that we used to do, now limited, they needed private capital. And I found myself sitting at the lending table versus sitting at the buying table oftentimes. And where I was struggling to make 10, 12, 15% return on my real estate investment, I could begin to partner with somebody in the real estate investment space make 10, 12, 15% in an area that they could then turn around and make 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, 50% because they were finding opportunities. And it created this vacuum where private lenders just rushed into. There's more capital and market today than we've ever seen in our history. And I think Dodd-Frank is the is the responsible party. And so to me, I know that everybody looks at it as like, that was the devil. That was the bad thing that happened out of the recession. I think what it did was it actually allowed our economy to shift, private capital to find a way in, and then we sustained ourselves. And then everybody found an opportunity as the as the market rose. So, you know, I don't know that I answered the really specific question you asked me, but more in broad stroke, I believe that is what happened. And then that was is what the outcome of what the Dodd-Frank bill uh, created and the reform that happened last year. You're the first person that has agreed with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, that's good. <laughs> I didn't know what your answer was going to be, but I knew it was going to be spot on. That's for sure. So, so more specifically now, Eddie, what would you say are two or three things that, that are still currently in place by law that a real estate investor should be aware of or, or not yeah. to do? I mean, like, for example, you know, anybody that's out there that's doing, you know, seller financing, you know, right. that, that may be a specific point, you know, to what people can do or what they can't do, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and some of the seller financing is regulated at a very high level. And I know there's a whole seller finance reform that's going to D.C. oftentimes. And I support those guys because I think seller financing is a great option for, for affordable housing to solve some of that problem. But, you know, with seller financing, obviously, you have a limited amount of deals that you can do per year before you're looked at as a lender. And I'm not sure the number. I think uh, it's, it's under 10, I believe, is the number. That's right. That's correct. And, and so you've got, you know, you've got that ceiling on you. The other ceiling that's created is obviously going out and getting, you know, more than 10 conventional mortgages. You've got that ceiling on you. But then guys that are doing big development deals, they have to be aware that these small banks that they're typically getting money from today, a lot of the small banks, my family's in the small banking industry and loves real estate investment. And so they're partnering with all these real estate developers. Most of them have a cap based on, you know, they, they have a lending cap based on their deposits and, and a whole equation. And so once you get past in a small bank that's got less than maybe 50 million, you know, 100 million worth of holdings, you know, you are typically never going to get beyond a threshold of, you know, a million to a million and a half, two million dollars uh, with them in lending capability. And so if your deals are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you can't always rely on the small banks, the credit unions and these small sources because they're capped based on this. You're going to have to go out and find other creative means. 
that's where, you know, a lot of these big funds come into place and private, you know, private groups and reggae offerings and all that type of stuff. I mean, then you got to get creative and get a little bit broader when you're doing bigger deals. One of my mantras, Eddie, is it's very hard to own real estate on a large scale out here until you own the real estate in between your ears. And, you know, you're a very successful person. Um, you strike me as the type of person that whatever you put your mind to, you're going to figure out a way to do it if you want to do it bad enough. And so I'd like to dig into your mind and your heart for a moment before we wrap up the show. What would you say are some of your you know, personal characteristics that have lended themselves to you getting to accomplish what you've been able to accomplish on the big picture over the years? Yeah. So, so to me, there's kind of three pillars of my life. Think, the three things that I'm chasing. Number one, time. You know, time is so important. You know, it's the three pillars I built Think Realty for: time, wealth, and purpose. I believe that you know, wealth isn't just money. Wealth is the ability to do what I need to do today and still have enough sustenance tomorrow. When you look at it on a global scale, and then ultimately purpose. I've got a large nonprofit, two of them actually. I have uh, radio and television stations outside of the U.S. Uh, some feeding centers and some orphanages. And for me, if I tie my work to my purpose, then oftentimes the mechanism, you know, to help me get to my purpose aligns itself. Real estate investing has just been the greatest, you know, tool and vehicle to get to my purpose. You know, I've told, you know, a lot of people around the country, if I could find a, a tool that was better than real estate or lending in real estate, I'd go do it. I just can't find one. It's not that I'm just a fanatic about real estate. It's that I'm a fanatic about the purpose that I want to accomplish in my life. And it's just the greatest tool that I've found. You know? And so for me, all of my accomplishments have been tied to a, a clear focus and vision on what my purpose is. And it is that purpose that, you know, yes, it's my family. Yes, it's providing. Yes, it's giving them a good life. But then it's doing something to impact this world for, for the greater good. You know? And so for me... Uh, focusing on that helps me constantly align and, and change. The second thing is we talk a lot about money in this investment space. Money is the, the constant conversation between us all. The problem is, is that then we'll turn around and, and say something like this. You know, my time is far more valuable than the money, right? Well, to me, the one thing that I, I was blessed with was a great family growing up. And my father oftentimes would say things like this. He would say, Eddie, I would say, Dad, I'm going to go buy a car, you know, 16, 17 years old. He'd say, okay, well, how much do you make per hour? Well, I make, you know, back then $7 an hour. Okay. So in order to buy that $10,000 car, it's going to cost you how many years worth of work to own that car? And he constantly drove home in my mind that there is a value to my time. I do it with my kids. I, I do it, you know, with their chores and, you know, my son that's in college. I constantly driving home that time has value more than money has value. And so instead of me focusing on the money I have, I focus on the time that I have. And I spend each day constantly tweaking and changing the schedule that I keep in order to accomplish more. The money always follows. If time really is our most valuable asset, and we should spend more time managing our time than time managing our money. The money that I make is always a byproduct of me using my time wisely in the opportunities that I have each and every day. So those are the two things, you know, stay, staying focused on my purpose rather than each daily mechanism to get to that purpose. And then choosing to spend more time managing my time than managing my money. I also sense that there's a spiritual foundation to yourself and your background. Am I sensing that correctly? Absolutely. Yeah. My nonprofit is Christian Media International, um, my own TV and radio stations. And it's those TV and radio stations that then support the feeding centers, the education centers, and the orphanages. Yes, sir. I was raised in a family of faith, and it is those faith based principles that really underline my life. And, you know, whether somebody is a person of faith or not, the principles are amazing. And, it's those principles that I was given as a child that have really served me well in my later life. Well, there's another reason we connect so well, Eddie. I, um, I respect you for that. Eddie, I tell you what, you've been a fantastic guest, and thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be with me today and for the audience. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you so much for what you do. So with that, folks, you have been introduced to the man himself. 
Eddie Wilson. Wow, what a story you've got. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us. And just one more time, Eddie, for those that are listening and not able to look at the show notes, how about give out your websites just one more time? Sure. So it's Think Realty, thinkrealty.com. That's for the Think Realty brand. And AAPL online, AAPL online.com for the American Association of Private Lenders. That's perfect. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And with this show and all the other shows, here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. Bye for now. We'll see you on the next show.